Welcome to A Learner's Journey. My name is Molly Sanders, and the goal of this podcast is to inspire and motivate you by connecting you with a variety of passionate horsewomen and men who have dedicated their lives to helping horses and their people. I'm grateful you're here. Welcome to this episode of A Learner's Journey. I'm excited to share this conversation with you. Karen is someone I've admired for a long time, and it was really fun to get a chance to chat with her. For those of you who know Karen, you know she's a dedicated and passionate educator who's brought the worlds of natural horsemanship and dressage together in a way that highlights the best of both. In this conversation, we explore a variety of topics, including the melding of natural horsemanship and dressage, Karen shares some great tips on riding with contact and how to embrace the challenges of learning. I'm really glad you're here. I hope you love this conversation. For those of you watching this episode, you're gonna notice we had some internet issues um, about 15 minutes into the podcast, um, Karen's internet actually completely shut down. So she used her phone as a hotspot and it's a little glitchy. So you're going to see some delay in the video and audio. I decided to include it anyway because it's such great stuff. And I wanted those of you that like to watch the podcasts on YouTube to still be able to see it. So you might have to just look away and listen for some of it when it gets really delayed. But um, the things that she shares are so great. I know you're going to love it. So just bear with us. Hi, Karen. I'm so excited that you're here on the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Oh, no problem. I love talking about horses. I could do this all day and I'm really happy you thought about me. Awesome. Yeah, your name, I, I pitched the idea a while back to my community that I was going to do podcasts. And I asked for suggestions of people they'd want to hear from. And your name has been top on the list. So Yay. I'm super excited <laughs> that I get to share you um, with them. So, um, so one of the things that I love hearing about is how people got started. So how did you get started with horses? With horses or the horse yeah. business? With just with horses, horses in general. Yeah. Yeah. I it was one of those, like the joke in the family was my first words were I want a horse, you know, then mom and dad. So it's just one of those for as long as I can remember. I was fascinated with all animals, but with horses. But I was lucky that my mom, uh, my mom had a horse when she was a kid, just like a trail horse. And then when I was young, like seven years old, she had a horse for a couple of years. And we kept it down at some property near the end of our street in suburbia. And so she used to let me go and play with him. And, and, you know, so that I was able to kind of get the little horse fix. And I went to summer camp, you know, every summer, horse, summer horse camp. And, you know, it's just like, I want a horse. I want a horse. I want a horse. And uh, they finally uh, <laughs> succumbed to my begging. Uh, so when I was in sixth grade, like 12 years old, um, I got my first horse, a little That's... ad in the paper. And <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. So your mom had her own. And so she kind of knew enough to possibly, did she try to steer you away from it? Or was she excited that you were into it? Or do you remember? No, I mean, she, she really loved horses. She just grew up trail riding in Western and California. And so when we were in New York, uh, she decided she wanted to try English and jumping and fox hunting. So she actually bought a fox hunter and she used to go fox hunting. Um, but no, she, she loved it. Cause she's like, go, go groom and tack up Bart, you know? So I go down there. It was just, nobody else was there. So I used to go down there at seven and I groom them and I get on them. <laughs> I ride them around. But um, yeah, my mom was very like, you know, she's like, you got to learn how to ride without a saddle before you can put a saddle on. And she's kind of like would head down. She used me as like her little groom. And so I'm glad I survived. He was a nice horse. Right. So I got a lot of natural little kid, little horse, nobody else around kind of time. Right. in. Um, so it worked out well, luckily. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. And then she got busy with us kids and just, it couldn't fit, you know, in her life. So I just did the, the camp and stuff like that until I got my own. But I think she really enjoyed 
having the horse around. She was a great horse show mom, you know, trailered me everywhere. So yeah, I think she really did enjoy it. Right. That's, that's awesome. Um, and then how, when did you start having ideas that you wanted to do it professionally? Uh, yeah, that wasn't supposed to happen. I was in, (laughs) I was in university. I was, I had a, I have a bachelor's in biology and I was actually kind of on track, uh, to be a scientific illustrator. Oh, wow. That's what I, cause I love art. I draw and I love science. So, you know, that was, that was pretty cool job. I thought, and that's what I was heading to do. Uh, but people, I was really competing a lot at that time and people kept asking me to train and ride their horses. And I, how do you say no to that? You know, mm-hmm. I just sort of thought, well, let's just keep doing that. And, and then I got invited, I was doing that freelance. And then I got invited by my trainer to come and work with some, a difficult horse at her farm. And I did really well with him. And she asked if I would stay on as a trainer. And so, you know, I was at a top dressage facility with my mentor there riding really nice quality horses. You know, I'm 18, 19, 20, you know, how do you, how right. do you know that? Right. Yeah. You know, so I just, that's the sort of happened. Right. And did you finish your degree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have my bachelor's and, you know, and I still do artwork. I illustrated my book and, you know, I do artwork any chance I get. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the horses just, just took over and it just, it just kind of kept going. <laughs> right. Well, I know that uh, there are a lot of people that are glad that you took that path. So a couple years ago, I don't remember where it was. I, I was, I saw you interviewed on a panel and you were talking about, I think it was your first horse mm-hmm. and, um, and how, what a great bond you had and how special it was um, being with this horse. And then you went on to uh, like, you just shared, you went on to train and then compete and, and you, in the back of your mind, um, you thought of this first horse as just kind of a special horse. It kind of stood out there. there, uh, The the other horses that came along weren't quite like him. And years later, you discovered why that was. Mm -hmm. Does this ring a bell? Oh, yeah. Okay. Would you mind sharing that? Because it really hit me. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to talk about that. So this was actually referring to my second horse, whose name was Brave Tom. And he was a thoroughbred. I got him when he was seven. He had an old bow tendon off the track thoroughbred and did not patch pass the pre-purchase exam for dressage, but like who wanted to do dressage? You know, <laughs> I was in pony club and doing eventing and stuff like that. So, you know, and so I had to do some dressage, but that horse, you know, I was with my trainer uh, at that time who happened to be a really good trainer who just happened to live, you know, close enough to me to take lessons And that horse ended up is the one that I competed at young riders on. He went all the way up the levels. And now that was with a lesson a week, maybe. And otherwise I'm training at home in the bushes with nobody else around Mm -hmm. in a, in like, you know, really not that great (laughs) area to ride. So looking back, you think, well, that shouldn't work. You buy a, you know, a thoroughbred who doesn't know dressage and a kid who 15 year old who doesn't know dressage ride in the bushes alone and have a goal of going to the highest levels and compete representing the country. Like that's not a recipe for success. That shouldn't right. have worked, right. but it did. So, you know, that was, that was my horse. It was my little kid in love with a horse horse. So uh, at some point he retired and, um, and I was then a professional and riding, you know, national, international quality horses. And my trainer and I actually used to joke of like, you know, you can either get the mind or you get the body, but it seems like you can't get both because here are these like uber talented horses who were like being difficult to train or getting stuck. And then I think back of my brave Tom who had all the strikes against them, blind leading the blind, and he would try for me. So, I mean, he did like, he did so much above and beyond. And I thought, wow, that was a really special horse. I, you know, I realized every day, like, wow, that horse was so special, what he gave to me. And then years go by and um, one of my students died and she willed me her horse and the horse she had, she was a very timid rider. So he was a pretty used up, shut down, 
we would have said bomb proof mm-hmm. uh, dressage horse. And I got him. And I mean, he was really shut down. Like you'd have a bucket of grain and he'd turn around and put his rear end to you. And uh, it it was not a good scene anyway. So he was mine now. And it was that horse that I sort of accidentally ended up in a David Lichman clinic with trying to do, you know, learn some cute little fun tricks for him to do as he retired because he was living at this dressage facility. So after going to that clinic and learning some amazing things and just this one clinic and starting to apply them, there was a moment where I saw the light go on in his eyes and started to have this really special connection because after Brave Tom, I didn't own my own horse until I had this horse's name is Vivaldi, nicknamed Bubba. Mm-hmm. It was always client horses and I was being very professional with them and I was kind of keeping an emotional distance because they weren't my horses. Right. Now here was my horse. And so here was this horse who was shut down, used up, not really sound. And all of a sudden the light starts going off and he starts offering. He starts doing more, you know, he used to avoid everything because he, I think he was in pain. And now he was like offering to do stuff. And because he was light, then he wasn't in as much pain. And, you know, I fixed his feet a little bit too, but you know, this all, it started spiraling up and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Like all of a sudden he's at, he's doing his best, even though he's kind of at his worst. And I thought, well, what, you know, I haven't met a horse like that since brave Tom. And I thought, well, what's the difference? The relationship, right? All the technique in the world. Yeah. You need to know some techniques, but the difference was the relationship. So all these uber talented horses who didn't feel like working for us. So that's when I started going, wow, the relationship doesn't, doesn't just feel good and is fun, but even from a very practical goal setting point of view, like your horse is going to perform better. If you do be let some emotions in. Right. So right. I let my emotions back in. And that's one of the reasons now I can't take horses in training anymore because I fall in love with them all. Right. right. You know? wow. So, um, yeah, but that that's that story. And, you know, just life-changing, life-changing yeah. realization for me. Right. right. Yeah, that is, that's huge. So yeah. then that brings me to one of the things that I'm really curious to hear from you is this, it, it sounds like that was kind of the beginning of, of the bridging between the natural horsemanship world and the dressage world, because with dressage naturally, what you've created, that's really the the goal is to bring the the best of those two worlds together, right? Yeah. And yeah. you know, um, I have experienced that those two ways of um, being with horses can become kind of isolated camps at times, right? So sometimes dressage folks look at natural horsemanship folks and go, oh my gosh, I don't wanna have anything to do with that and vice versa, right? And it can be um, uh, where they aren't talking to each other or sharing ideas. So, you know- I know that feeling well. (laughs) Yes, and you're in the middle of it, right? So you know both really well. Um, What could you say to, a dressage person um, to to help them understand how the natural horsemanship um, could help them, and then vice versa. Like, but first mm-hmm. to start with the dressage folks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, you know, definitely when I first started this, it was definitely like there's where's the camera, <laughs> like two camps, and you know, I was here, and then I went here, and then as soon as I went over here, everybody says you're crazy, and then right. the people are like you're crazy, and you know, like okay, I'm crazy. Uh, but it, <laughs> I know this stuff works now, you know, I think, I think of natural horsemanship less as a discipline and more of like a container and my dressage lives inside this container. I think we humans, you know, the people who tend to like natural horsemanship tend to be, you know, people who spend a lot of time with natural horses, which tend to be Western-y. So it starts to get that look, but it's mm-hmm. really has nothing to do with that. Right. Uh, So for me, it's kind of about being, you know, looking at the horse as a natural, as as in in their natural state, and then using that information in a, in a fair way. But I think really the, 
the main point is that there's a mental, emotional, and physical aspect of our horse. And when I was in dressage land exclusively, you know, I was pretty expert in physical development and a little bit about mental, emotional, but I couldn't really talk about it the same way I could talk about how to supple or engage or strengthen or, you know, a horse. So from what the natural horsemanship reminded me and taught me was how to recognize what's in a mental and emotional problem and how to solve it with a mental or emotional exercise. So dressage riders tend to solve everything from a physical standpoint. Everything, everything's a physical problem. So everything gets solved in a, in a, some sort of physical exercise kind of way, but that's only a third of the, the point. So the flip side of the coin is when I went to natural horsemanship land, I realized that everything was being looked at through the lens of mental emotional, but sometimes it was a physical problem. <laughs> so I think that's what we can all learn from each other. It's like, we've all, we're all putting our attention on a slightly different thing. And the more we do what you're doing, which is like sharing, helping to share knowledge, then, you know, we can look and say, is this a mental problem, an emotional problem or physical problem? Right. And then when you identify it, go, okay, what, what does the solution look like? If it's in a mental, if it's a mental issue, then it's about, there's a lack of understanding. So we need to clarify our communication. If it's an emotional issue, it's, it's the horse isn't able to do they're not in the right state of mind or can't handle doing something that they can do and they understand. So whether they're bored or lack of motivation or afraid, we have to get them back to a emotional state. And then physical, we have to think, well, is it strength or stamina or coordination? Right. All of those things have different strategies. Right. It, it, once you start to look at it that way, you go, well, let's go learn what the dressage people know to learn more about physical and let's go learn what people who have been observing horses, you know, and thinking about mental, emotional, let's go see what they're figuring out. And then it all comes together. And I, I'd love to like state the object of dressage because this, this statement is what really um, illustrates like how these things blend already. I don't even need to be the bridge. I'm just sort of telling people, Hey, this all makes sense. Right. Because even according to the dressage rule book, it says that the object of dressage is the development of the horse into a happy athlete through harmonious education, resulting in a horse that's calm and loose and supple and flexible, but also confident, attentive and keen, thus achieving perfect understanding with his rider. So when you look at that, it's like that could be a definition of nat- the object of natural horse. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the way, you know, sometimes it takes breaking things down into simple components to yeah. see the richness of things. Mm-hmm. And the way that you're looking at it is, you know, mental, emotional, physical. I mean, we've all heard that, but when you really look at it, it's something we all want, but you're absolutely right that in the natural horsemanship world, we tend to go toward the mental, emotional, and not that we leave out the physical, but we don't tend to go there as much it's not a goal and um and if if we all agree that those are the three things that we want all of a sudden there it's huge that's such a huge amount of information and you know and finding people that have become expert in one area and you know learning from them you know it sounds like that's kind of what you what you have done like you yeah. really delved into the dressage world. Then you spent time, you know, with Pat and Linda and other, and David, you know, other natural horsemanship people. Um, yeah. So we really could benefit from listening to each other a little bit more. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and just one, one horse is an, ex- <clears throat> excuse me, as an example that I played with, you know, that was a Pirelli horse and, you know, played with that, but, and she would get very impulsive. Um, and so a lot of impulsion programs, impulsion programs, impulsion programs. And then I started to notice that she was a little more impulsive on one lead rather than the other. Mm-hmm. And one lead would get not impulsive and the other lead would, and I'm thinking that's not emotional. She's not, it, she was emotional, but she was emotional because she was out of balance. Right. 
And so then I was like, wait a minute, well, I'm going to go sneak in some dressage exercises, Mm -hmm. (laughs) balance her up and straighten her and get rid of the crookedness. And then all of a sudden she was not emotional on the right lead also. So that's the kind of filter you can start to look through and just be, you know, be willing to to step back and get the whole picture and go, what's really happening here. We're always taking a best guess anyway at anything we do. So you know, to stand back and go, what are, you know, assess your horse's mental, emotional, and physical state and see if you can figure out they're all going to affect each other, you know, so make progress in each, but if you can figure out the core issue, then you'll get there faster. That's great. Um, and do you have any recommendations for folks that want to, pursue dressage and maybe they want to seek out a trainer to get some help, but they're from the natural horsemanship world. Like, are there questions that you could ask or what would you recommend someone do to make sure that it's a good fit? Well, I would always recommend they check out my programs because, you know, you can have a a good trainer in your pocket. You know, I I have some step-by-step programs in my video classroom that really helps immerse people in a community and then in that community too like on our live calls we actually can help people um, translate for their instructor because every instructor's sort of personality is different but you know we'll just say that's a given come come see see my stuff because then you'll you'll be students get more confident in knowing what they can do with their horse and then when it's appropriate to hire a dressage instructor because sometimes if you're still having foundational issues and you go to dressage trainer too soon, there's going to be foundational issues showing up that that dressage trainer is not going to know they're, how to solve because they want to be a dressage trainer. Right. And I see that all the time. It's like they're trying to teach a dressage lesson to a horse who's not ready. So my recommendation just in general, anytime you're going to take a lesson from anybody is go audit, watch, see what it feels like. Are people crying in the barn after their lessons? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> sometimes yeah. they don't cry out there in the arena and sometimes right. they do it, you know. So yeah. really look and 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 then ask your you know trainer questions. I really think any trainer should, any student should be able to stop in the middle of the lesson and go, I have a question. And you know, how does that trainer handle that? Are they acting out of ego? So go audit and really observe and put yourself there and and then ask, you know, be very, um, be able to, to sort of assess where you are and what problems you're, ha- you're having, be able to articulate exactly the challenges you have, and then be honest of whether that instructor is the right one to handle that. Right. You know, I've seen really good dressage trainers, really good dressage trainers. I was at a clinic and this is a guy I would take dressage lessons from, but this one horse came in and he was balking going into the covered arena, didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to go, didn't want, it was his time, get him in there. And Mm -hmm. then he kind of like locked up and then they end up chasing around the arena with a dressage whip. And I'm thinking if they had just gone outside, right. They could have had a dressage lesson, but now they're like, they tried to get a dressage lesson done when that horse mentally, emotionally wasn't ready for it. And I thought, well, that's just dumb, you know, (laughs) no. And then I went in and had a lesson with a guy and I loved it because I was having a dressage lesson with a horse who was ready to have a lesson in what his expertise was right right so I think you you just as a student so many times like the teacher becomes this guru and the student feels like they have to conform to be that teacher like no you're hiring someone to help you Mm -hmm. know what you want be able to assess exactly who you are and what you need Mm -hmm. and then interview them (laughs) make sure they're going to be a good fit for you right that's that's so good Um, And it's such a good example too, of what you were talking about, where it was this person that's so um, skilled with dressage, but doesn't have the foundational piece um, Mm -hmm. possibly. Um, And so a foundational problem could turn into a dressage problem. Right. Um, Right. That's a really good example. Now now that same guy lets me ride bitless. So he, he loves what I do. And he's, and I, you know, first lesson, I so I do weird stuff uh-huh. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Right. I'm like, okay, great. Right. We, we'll get along then, right. <laughs> you know, but so you just, yeah. And that's just your instincts on it. Yeah. That's a good, that's just, it's a great example where he's, he's a perfect person for you, but someone mm-hmm. else, that person, the other person that you talked right. about, they would have benefited from 
taking your program um, and getting more of the foundational pieces fixed and then exactly. going and finding somebody. So this gets me curious about your program. So will you tell us a little bit more about like if somebody um, comes in and joins, what, what are they, what are they getting? Well, there's a lot of different ways to learn. And I just, I love helping people learn. So I have different ways. So we have, um, I have a book and the book comes with video. So for people who like to really sit down on the couch and go deep into the theory, we've got that. Uh, then I also have my video classroom, which is, it's a subscription site. So I put new videos up every month and there's like over 400 videos in there on a wide range of subjects from like partnership and mindset and time management all the way to like PL off and flying changes. I have guest presenters in there. So I kind of put everything in there and then I just make it really searchable. It's in different categories. You can write in a search term and it's, it's inexpensive. It's like $29 a month and you get it. There's a, a free trial for a week. So you can like check it out, <laughs> you know, take a look, see if it's a good fit for you. That's really good for people who um, need kind of new ideas. They want to be inspired because every week, Every month, I mean, there's like something new in there, um, but you've got to be a little bit of a good independent learner because it is random. You know, you're going to have to get curious and go find the video. You can always email us and we have a Facebook group that says, hey, I'm looking for a video on such and such and we'll help you out. Right. Uh, and then I have step-by-step -step courses. So for okay. people who want to go in and go, just tell me what to do. <laughs> There's literally like module one, step one, module two, step one, two, three, you know, and um, depending on the course, um, we have a horsemanship course, which is more foundational. And then we have the sweet spot course, which is really, it's a course, but it's really a ton of support. So I have live calls every week. We can do private video coaching. I've got coaches from around the world that are in there helping so it's really supportive and it's really in-depth into um, finding the sweet spot of healthy biomechanics. Right. Uh, so those are the main, the main ways people learn. And so most people start with the classroom or the book. Um, and then if they need more help, they go on from there. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you, I, that's cool. The way you said it, that, you know, you're trying to really um, address different learning styles and different places that people are in their journey. So you have a ton of different options. That's, yeah. that's really cool. I didn't know all of that. So that's really oh, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you so, can also, if you, if you're in there and you're like, I don't know, if you look at my website and you're like, I don't know what to do, you can actually book a private consult with my assistant, who's a, a dressage naturally instructor, and we'll just talk to you and find out what's going on. And then we'll make a, a recommendation for which is going to be the best fit. So you can always talk. It's really easy to get to talk to somebody and get some personal attention. Right. In dressage right. Naturally land. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, and they can find out about all of that on your website, which is dressage naturally. Yeah. Dressage naturally dot okay. net. If awesome. you write in anything close to that, Google will find me. <laughs> okay, cool. That's great. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes and I'll put it on the oh, video too. Beautiful. So, um, so talking about learning, uh, and I know that that's something that you're fascinated with. Um, can you, cause it, you know, it, going through the learning process is not always smooth and seamless. Like we think it might be right. We see mm -hmm. other people that are so good at something and we think, oh, they, they've had it easy. You know, it's going to be easy for me to get there. And it doesn't take long to find out that that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, can you think of a time that you struggled as a learner and what, what was it that helped you through yeah, I think it's, it's funny when I think about that, I, I don't really think of learning as a struggle or if I do, that doesn't have any negative meaning to me because the whole nature of learning means you're trying to do something you can't do yet, <laughs> right. Right? right? So it kind of seems, it, of course, it's not going to work. So if you, you could use the word struggle to describe that, but if things aren't working, it means things are going perfectly. Right. That's the whole point. So I think the point is to 
um, navigate that process of moving from I can't do it yet to I can with a positive attitude. And, and that's what I call the productive struggle. Right. Really like so that. it's like you're struggling, but you're going you, you're going somewhere. Right. Um, if you look if you look at the, the definition of struggle, the main definition says to do something with forceful or violent effort. Oh my. So like, let's not struggle. <laughs> you know, who wants to do that? But right. if you go deeper down the list, you know, the like six or seven definitions down, it says to make one's way with difficulty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing. We're making yes. one's way. We're going somewhere. And that's why I think to put that word productive struggle in front of it, it's like we're struggling so that we learn and we improve and then we can do it. Otherwise, if you just say struggle, it just sort of feels like it's effort. Yes. Right. Don't tell you it gets anywhere. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the, to, like, it's like you said, to expect it. It's, you know, I, in, in dressage country, call it the messy middle, like mm-hmm. oh, you're in the messy middle. Right. It's exactly where you should be. Yeah. Um, that's just how it is. So I get, it's, it's all in your attitude towards it. When you can't do something, you just go, well, of course not. I haven't practiced right. it enough. Right. So you just keep going. You just yeah. keep going. And so um, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I had a heck of a time learning walk pirouettes. I mean, my trainer would used to throw up her hands and go, you're just terrible at this, <laughs> you know? And so that didn't feel good, but no. no, it's something I'm really good at. You know why? Because I had to struggle. I had to, um, make my way with difficulty. And now I know pure walk pirouettes inside out backwards for it. I can teach it and train it. Like I, I own that one. Because right. I had to do it. If it came naturally, I probably couldn't teach it. Right. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's I think so just to, to keep that curiosity and just go, yeah, and this is how it should be. And right. as soon as you frame it otherwise, you're going to, now you're just, you're fighting. Right. Now you're using forceful and violent effort, and that's right. not going to get you anywhere. Right. That's so yeah. good. That's so good. <laughs> and because so, so often, just those little tweaks in perspective can make all the difference. And what you said there about that's, you know, seems obvious, but when you're learning something, it means that you're doing something you can't do and you're moving toward being able to do it. So of course it's going to not come easily. Like just even that little shift could make such a huge difference to people because it's easy to get caught up in thinking that this should come easily you know, I, if, if, uh, if I'm going to be able to do it, I should be able to just take a couple steps and move into being able to do it. And, you know, it's not, it isn't the case. And like you said too, the productive struggle, it's, it's such a joyous thing when you become, a, I, I love that word, a productive learner. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the struggle becomes something that is, um, I don't know, uh, I guess appreciated. It may not be pleasant necessarily, but you know that it means that you're heading toward where you want to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And it, it, it becomes a lot more pleasant than being, you know, some people will get frustrated and they'll say, well, I'm a perfectionist. And so, and like, no, if you were a perfectionist, you'd be doing it perfectly. Right. When <laughs> being a perfectionist is not, you know, they're right. happy. But when right. people say, are frustrated and they say, well, I'm a perfectionist. It means it's code for I'm judging myself really harshly for not doing it well, as well as I think I should. And now you're just fighting yourself. Right. So, you know, just where you think, you know, you see beginners doing, you know, just making a mess of things, but they're happy because they don't don't even know how, you know, so that's the hard part is to keep that beginner's mind and just stay curious and just keep going. And when you feel frustration, you, you learn, train yourself to ask an empowering question. So not like, why the heck can't I do this? What's wrong with me? Like, no, not that kind of question. Just go, right. oh, I wonder what else I could do. I wonder who could help me with this. Mm-hmm. What, what am I missing? Right. What do I need to learn? You know, so you just have to train your brain to just accept where you are mm-hmm. and then figure out what else you need. Yeah, that's great. And I think for me, as I've gone through this journey, being able to talk to somebody, you know, someone like you, oh, yeah. people that have more experience, and then hearing that it's, it's, uh, it's similar, you know, we all have difficulties and, but hearing how you're dealing with it, 
it's so yeah. inspiring. And so I know I'm, I can imagine that there's a lot of people sitting and listening to this or watching this going, oh my goodness, you know, they've yeah. gotten a ton of different ideas. So I really appreciate you oh, sharing. Good. Yeah. And, and I know this not because I teach all these people who struggle with it. I know it because, yeah, I know what that feels like. And I've okay. had my share of like, what the heck is wrong with me? But now I can identify and go, wow, I'm really frustrated here. <laughs> and I can sit myself down. And again, you just train your brain to, to ask a different question. Right. Um, so yeah, it's possible. I'm with you guys. Anybody yeah. experiencing this, I know what it feels like. And, right. and you know, it, you can change it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I want to ask you a question about um, riding with contact. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've, you know, taught lots of students, worked with a lot of students. Um, what, what do you see as a common thing that comes up for people with contact? Um, and what could you share with them to help? Yeah, that's a big subject. So yeah. that was one thing. um, here's, here's one thing that I see a lot. I'll see if I can do this. It's like, and if, if people are just listening, I'll try to describe what I'm doing, but they'd be like, Everything is going great. Where's the camera? Everything's going great until I do take the contact. And then they like make a fist and grab their arms at their side. Right. And then like my horse is going great. And then I took the contact. And again, they do everything like contracting. I'm like, I wonder why. You know? Mm -hmm. So I think the the just the phrase taking the contact is a problem. Uh, in more westerny things, there's things like, you know, that your horse gives his face. Or something like that. So contact for me is there's nothing taking about it. Not one drop. I'm not creating a shape with the neck. I'm not asking for a flexion. You know, yes, I do flexion exercises. So my horse can follow the feel of the reins standing still. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to riding in, in contact where we're in it, you know, I'm thinking in dressage where we want a, a, a posture, mm -hmm. not a frame but we're tr trying to create this posture and connect to it um, that we don't take, that the posture is created in the mental, emotional state of the horse and in the body. And most of the horse is not his mouth <laughs> or head. <laughs> most of the horse you can influence without the reins. So um, the contact is much more like a dance, like dancing the waltz. Right. Right. You're, you're in balance, you're connected, you're moving as one, and then you add the arms but the guy doesn't grab the woman by the arms and pull her right, <laughs> you know, right. here, stay here. So, right. um, yeah, so it's really about what are the reins for mm -hmm. and in riding dressage, I think there's, there's three purposes of the reins. So one is, um, subtle communication about the position of the head at the end of the neck. So subtle. Because mm -hmm. I mean, even bridalists, I can have a horse raise or lower their head and mm -hmm. I can create a bend right or left. You know, if I bend mm -hmm. the body to the right, the head will look to the right. But at the end of the neck, if I need to make a little change of like, hey, could you move your head two degrees to the right or make your neck just like one inch longer or shorter, like the reins are the best tool for that. Mm -hmm. You can do it with sticks and stuff, but it's just not as nice. It's a lot clearer with reins. So right. subtle communication of position of the head at the end of the neck. Mm -hmm. And then number two purpose is uh, to receive information, right? Because you can think you're going along fine. You shorten the reins. You could swear you shorten both reins equally. And then you look down and one rein is loopy and the other rein is tight mm -hmm. or one hand keeps wanting to cross over the neck. So mm -hmm. you just go, huh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm getting information about my horse's balance now that the reins are there. So all problems of the horse will show up in the reins when the reins are there, but almost no problem solved with the reins. That's the problem because mm -hmm. now they're in our human hands and that dominates our brain. The part of our mm -hmm. brain that deals with hands takes is a huge area. So anytime we feel something in our hands, our human brains are going, do something with your hands to fix that. <laughs> and you have to train yourself not to do that. So the third purpose is another point of connection in this all is one circuit of energy like dancing the waltz so good dancers of the waltz can dance the waltz without using their arms that's part of the practice i took ballroom dance lessons for a few years and it's okay. very analogous mm -hmm. but the the arm connection adds to it 
there's this like, oh my gosh, we are all as one. Mm-hmm. There's no floppy bits out there. Everything's connected. And you get them all the power and all that subtlety of moving all as one. But the, when I learned the waltz, we learned to do each of our steps independently next to each other, then facing each other, then facing each other and touching. And then we did the arms and not before that. Okay. So the biggest problem people have with contact is some form of lack of balance. The horse is out of balance. They're rolling forward or they're sucking back or they're crooked. You know, you can make a long list. It's going to show mm-hmm. up in the reins. The trick is to not solve it in the reins. Your hands are showing you information and you have to override your brain and go, why? Why is the horse leaning on my left rein? It's not because he needs to necessarily give his jaw or give his face or do little squeezy supply things on his jaw. Mm-hmm. That'll probably make him want to give lean on it even more mm-hmm. to protect himself. Right. Um, so yeah, to go, huh, why is he leaning on the left side? Is it his shoulder, his haunches? You know, where is he crooked? How am I sitting? Things like that. And that's really hard for humans to do uh, is to put something in our hands. Yes. And then not, not use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that I, I have not heard your second step. I've not heard that explained like that before okay. that the reins can be used to get information. When you yeah. first said it, I thought you meant to give information. Right. And that's yeah. the opposite of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, when I, when I usually ask people, what are the purpose of the reins? I get, you know, steering, bending, flexing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and you know, that's the thing is I've now done natural horsemanship. I have ridden bridalists. Mm -hmm. So I know what's possible to get with no reins. Right. And I can, I can have a horse in balanced impulsion. I can do speed control. I can have the horse basically lower or raise his neck. No Mm -hmm. one to stretch, no one to not. Mm -hmm. I can bend the body. And if the neck is part of the body, the neck, you know, if you bend something in the middle, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it naturally, you know, so, you know, I was like, wow, that's a lot of stuff that I don't need the reins for. So if I make sure I'm not using the reins for any of the things that I don't really need reins for my chance of lightness and a positive connection Mm -hmm. goes way up. Because I'm not needing my reins to regulate the speed or keep the bend or hold the shoulder or, you know, keep them on the line of travel. Mm -hmm. And now I'm supposed to be light. I'm doing 10 things with the reins and now they're supposed to be light, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, right. That's harder. So, yeah, that's really, it's really, really great. And like you said, when I first asked that question, it's such a huge topic. It is. Um, yeah. There's a million ways to get it wrong. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, but when, and, if, if you take care of things, what you're left with is a horse in balance and then you hold hands with them. Right. So it's more, the contact for me is more about getting rid of all the things that are getting in the way mm-hmm. of it being a positive contact. And then that's fun because you're problem solving often really basic things. Mm-hmm. And and then when you problem solve that, you know, I'll, I'll do a three-day dressage clinic and never talk about the contact. And at the end, everybody's going around beautifully and their mm-hmm. contact problems are solved, but we didn't address it. And in my course, the contact isn't even in there until module five of okay. the six module course. Right. And by the time we get there, they're, they're like, well, I came in with a contact problem. We didn't work on contact. Now I'm in module five for the contact and I don't have a problem anymore. I go, I know. Right. It's by design. <laughs> right. That's so, it's so interesting. And it's similar for those folks that are familiar with the Pirelli program. It's similar to that in that, you know, the finesse piece, the riding with contact doesn't come in until the very end, but there isn't um, one of the areas that is weaker in the program is there isn't a lot of information for folks on how to actually do that. So here are the people that get really skilled at riding bridalists and doing all these things. But then what you said in the beginning, where you had that visual of what happens when you take the reins and you're just tight yeah. like this, that's yeah. exactly what happens because yeah. one, people are worried that they're going to hurt their horse. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they were not sure what kind of a feel and, and what are we truly trying to do? And so it's wonderful that, you know, you're, a resource that people can go to and, mm-hmm. and learn, learn those things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And one thing people can try is just um, to practice taking the slack out of the, go from freestyle, lo- long reins, loose reins, 
to taking the slack out of the reins. And the goal is that nothing changes. Nothing else changes. Right. You don't clench your jaw. You don't clench your biceps. The Mm. horse doesn't try to do something weird that can you just take the slack out of the reins and it's the horse knows that those rein shortening does not mean you're going to take anything. It's right. just decoration. Right. And then at least you're starting from neutral. Right. You don't, the horse doesn't think, oh, they're shortening their reins. They're going to take something. And it takes a lot of control to like do that and just let them back and forth until they, you know, they realize you're not going to, you're not going to take anything. And yeah, that, that at least will, you'll see if there's any weird problems coming in. Right. And Um, would you do that at a standstill to start with, or does it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can do that, that it's like a friendly game with the reins, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, just make sure. And, but, but keep scanning your own bodies as much as you scan your horses. Um, Right. Yeah. That's really, that's really good. Yeah. Um, So um, do you have, we talked a little bit about your program, um, do you have any, are you traveling to teach at all or are people um, coming to you? Yeah, I do. It kind of varies. I've done some, I did a clinic in Texas this year and I went to Equine Affair and Equitana Expos this year. My first real traveling from <laughs> since COVID. Um, right. I'm probably going back to Texas again. I'm, I'm right now I'm in a little bit of a phase of, I like being home. <laughs> Mm-hmm. you know, most people with COVID, they're like, oh no, I'm like, no, I love being right. home. So I'm a yeah. little bit in that zone. Uh, but at some point I'll, I'll travel again. <laughs> right. And are you, are, can people come to you? Is that something? Um, sometimes I have a couple mm-hmm. clinics here a year okay. and um, some lessons, but really my, my biggest focus has been on getting these courses you know, it's the, it's the way that people can start working with me right away. Right. And a lot of times when I go to areas, um, I'll tend to find areas where they're like, yeah, I've got 10 people. They're all in your classroom or they've all taken your course. And I tend to prioritize those groups because then we just take things to the next level. Right. Uh, but actually I'm really excited. Um, I'm going to be doing a clinic next summer um, with a, a massage school for horses. Oh, wow. So we're going to be kind of collaborating because I do some moving massage technique and some techniques to get them in healthier biomechanics. So I'm going to be working with the massage school students and, you know, learn, they'll be learning from me. I'm planning on learning from them too, to see how how I can, you know, what they're seeing and how I can improve my techniques. And I think that's going to be a really um, interesting um, session we'll videotape it and uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of neat stuff that comes out of that so that is great where that. where is that happening that is going to be in Seattle oh wow oh that's cool yeah. that's and I wish I, had the name. I don't want to get the name wrong it's like something like the northwest school of massage okay. and massage or something okay. like that I should have oh, had that that's great that's it'll, really- it'll yeah anybody on my mailing list will hear about that once we do it but yeah they're super interested and uh curious and so am I right that's great that that's a whole melding of two more yeah. new worlds uh yeah, well I, some of my exercises I've had people come up to me that are like Feldenkrais practitioners they're like what you're doing is so similar to Feldenkrais and other people are like oh that's so like yoga oh that's so like massage oh that's so like you know energy so I'm really looking forward to getting with some people who are really focused on that and going, okay, what am I doing? Like, look, watch this exercise. And cause it really, and it's their exercises that I'm hoping their practice practitioners can also learn and then teach to their, um, their clients for the horses who kind of have the returning chronic problems and changing the movement pattern and body work really go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And I think you need to, address both ends that right. unless you change the movement pattern, they're going to keep going out, you know, or getting tense in the same places. And right. then of course the body work helps change the movement pattern. So it's a really right. interesting dynamic. Yeah, that'll be great. And your students are going to love it. I'm sure. Cause you're going to bring a bunch of stuff back. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's interesting. I'm yeah. really looking forward to it. That's great. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, answer these questions and share so many, um, just 
super interesting ways of looking at learning and horsemanship. And, uh, and then you gave us some practical things to try. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and spending this time with us. So thank thank you. you so much. I loved, I loved the questions you asked. It was great, great awesome. things to talk about. So thank you. I feel so grateful for people like Karen who have delved into a craft 110% and learned a ton and become experts in their field. And then beyond that, have the passion to share what they have learned with others. And I also feel really grateful that I get a chance to bring some of these people to you. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day.